breakdown and repair invite us to step into a certain regime of valuing that a certain set of material and political actions and to kind of negotiate what repair is possible in this space. So I know that a lot of people kind of criticise repair and say, well, it's a very normative construct, it's, a, it's nostalgic and conservative, it's about rolling things back to this kind of prior notion, it doesn't allow us to do the paradigm shifts that we need to kind of do ecological reparation on a planetary scale or this planetary level fix that we urgently need to do. But for me, I'd, why I really like the idea of ecological reparation is that it's kind of opening up beyond repair and into reparation. And I like the dual meaning there that kind of accrues to justice when we think about reparations, for example, for the slave trade. So it's inviting us to think, actually, how can we move from where we are to do something better because that is what we want and to kind of engage with the politics of that both as a question of kind of pragmatically getting together to to kind of fix broken down environments but also politically to think about accountabilities because we must in order to be able to repair so we really have to grapple with this idea of reparation in its sense of encouraging us to think about well you know who perpetuated these injustices and actually what do we do about those i think following on from laura's point Ecological reparation for me, it's an invitation. It's an invitation to think about what have become almost tropes for us in the social sciences around scale and scope. You know, how do we deal with um, the local? So for example, the local at this farm and, and yet at the same time, the urban or the national, or the global, and certainly within questions of ecology or sustainability, we're always drawn to these kind of scales of local versus global. And yet, reparation has to operate across these somehow, so that the invitation is a sense, um, an invitation to trouble uh, scale or to, to trouble scope. So something that's interested me, and I think that follows on in the work that we've been doing, is thinking about infrastructures that somehow enable us to ask questions across scale, that might, in a sense, um, flatten scale for us. And I think that's an ongoing project for me as part of the work we're doing. So looking at at food, ecological repair has been, thinking about ecological repair in food system has been, has been thinking about how we might um, look at alternative um, sort of agricultural practices and, and practice social practices around food. Um, and so the, the urban farm, like this one, is, is where most of my research has taken place. And it, for me, it's like a real example of um, ecological and social reparation, I suppose, because it, um, it, it's really about um, giving access to, to local people who maybe live. So this is, um, we're, we're based in um, Tower Hamlets, which is one of the most deprived boroughs in the UK. And um, it's, it's quite, um, there's a lot of food deprivation here. The people don't have access to um, healthy eating options. Um, so a place like this is an opportunity for people to come together to encounter each other and, and kind of repair social bonds um, in the city, but also to, to nourish those um, relations within the food web and within, you know, the the web of life, I suppose, and, and repair those, those relations. And, you know, it, it's become this really, I mean, it's not, it's not idyllic because there are so many problems still, but it, it's like, for me, it's, a, it's a, an example of, you know, what ecological reparation in the city could be. And so the project was also kind of exploring how we might, you know, 
expand it and what and what the city might look like if we you know if the whole city looked like this I, I, I really like um, Michelle Murphy's ideas around um, the altar life as opposed to the aftermath. And in particular, what you know, I understand her trying to do there is to think about how um, living through e ecological disaster is an ongoing um, project. It's not, there's not a before and after, um, from the, you know, the minute the earth came to, into being, um, we were living with, in a sense, um, an ecological state of um, ongoingness. And so we're all part of that exercise, if you like. I like the idea um, that Lauren Brandt um, draws on around a pedagogical unlearning, um, an unlearning of this idea that there are states that we should be sort of aiming for, or trying to achieve as though there were maybe some romanticized past of when things were pure or innocent in some sense. Um, and so Berlant talks about a, a much more sort of um, an idea of infrastructuring, I suppose, where we are continually thinking about infrastructures that might enable um, conditions in which we work together towards, for example, ecological reparation. Um, and to me, you know, it's drawing attention away from structures as static things or an end point in which um, we might have some idealized or romanticized version of living with, with nature or whatever it might be, um, to these almost experiments in living. And I see very much the work that we do, the pro sorts of projects that Lara and Sarah and I are involved in are these sort of experiments in trying to think kind of infrastructurally in that way. Focusing on social and ecological reparation in the city, I'm really drawn to this idea of the right to, the, right to the city as sort of a never-ending project. You never, you never get there. It's just something that we're always working towards. And I think, you know, like places like this and the kinds of experiments that we've been interested in exploring is, you know, is part of that, like we're constantly making you know, but we'll never get there. For many of the people that I've worked with, you know, that very idealised nature versus culture has never kind of been a reality anyway. So I sort of think reparation is useful because it keeps us hopeful that we can do something together, even if we start in the most dire state. So for me, it's about, yeah, what can we do? What capacities can we bring? And when we look at those specific relations, what happens when we do that together? And I think justice is a huge part of those kinds of negotiations. So the way people come to a matter of concern, how it affects them practically, it's a very interesting kind of thing to think with. Well, what, what would it mean? What, you know, what would you like to do together now? What, what would you like? And this kind of invitation to think this very situated practical ethics. So, you know, when you come to decide, you know, sustainability in terms of like, what do we sustain? What do we re rehabilitate? And kind of like really getting up close to the, the kind of politics of that. So, you know, repair because it's situated and practical and engaged and embodied. It's very different to the kind of, you know, some of the governance, you know, techno-utopian governance fantasies of sustainability that we might think, you know, of green growth as, as a kind of way. And, and you mentioned scale, Alex, to kind of think these large scale reparations where, you know, it is very much this idea of fix, but when we get to reparation, it invites us into this much different, sticky, embodied kind of situated situation where actually what's ethical and just and what we do together, those are all questions that are up for discussion that we have to work out in that place at that time. And I think that for me is what 
we need to do now actually is to start with the techno utopian visions and really to get practical as as a kind of scale our object climate change you know goes between these very local very difficult problems and these you know it's actually messing with scale and actually reparations also inviting us to mess with scale in a similar way to have local enactments but also to kind of tendril those outwards into different policy spaces like but for me it's really important to start from a place from a time from you know from from an ecology new technologies like blockchain, AI, sensor networks, you know, they're, they're all being harnessed, harnessed by, by big businesses all over the world to, um, to intensify agricultural production, okay? But the, the, the ultimate aim is to increase the profits of companies. It's, it's not to, um, yeah, it's not, it's not to, to share food with people or to give people access to food. Um, and a lot of these technologies have quite a high uh, barrier to entry for just regular people. So, so all those things are compounded together. So if we, if we allow, you know, big companies, um, governments, tech companies, food companies to ha have a monopoly over the, the algorithmic systems, then they will, you know, they will just use it to to, to, you know, to, to intensify the, the profits and, and increase the inequalities, the existing inequalities within the food system. So that was the kind of the initial um, thing that we were interested in. So, and, then what, and then we wanted to explore, well, what, what happens if we um, try and involve, you know, grassroots, small scale, diverse, um, um, not, not very technical uh, urban growers and communities and bring them into the conversation about what um, what food justice might look like and how we might harness these new technologies and specifically blockchain to, to create a more equal and just food system. And not just for humans, but for the other uh, non-humans with which we share our cities and with which we are interdependent um, within the food system. So I don't know if you, maybe you want to add something about <laughs> Do you want to say something about the, the methods we use to, I, I don't know, does anyone yeah, I was, want to say? I was thinking just in response to maybe bringing these ideas of justice and um, algorithmic food justice together as well. Um, you know, I, I love the question of sort of asking us, well, what does justice mean, particularly in this context? And I think justice is about well, one way of thinking about justice is sort of how you bring people to the table, as it were, and not only people, but how you bring all possible actors to the table. Um, and so I think, and it's not, but it's more than just that. It's, not, it's more than just bringing people into the same space. It's thinking, how do you enable a set of relations through which people can think together? And for me, that's what um, ideas like the blockchain or thinking algorithmically might do is they might reinvent a potential for new kinds of relations. And I think that's, that's what we were doing in a sense in the, in the project that we've written about is that we were op being open to the possibility of new ways in which we might relate to each other and the blockchain invites that. It's one potentiality into that space of thinking together. I just add that, yeah, the pro it was kind of thinking about how sort of marginalised stakeholders within the global industrial food system um, might be brought to the table in these discussions about the designing of new technologies to, to create fairer food systems. And the, and the interesting thing, the, the reason why we were drawn specifically, do you want us to move on to that bit? Why blockchain? Yeah. Or do you want to add something? Yeah, I'd say that algorithmic food already exists and that we were bringing the justice to that. And I think for me, I want to channel our collaborator, Ruth Catlow, a bit. She's unfortunately not here and say that actually, um, you know, the fantasy visions of sustainability or the, the intensification of um, logistics and, and industrial art, art, 
um, agriculture, they're already looking to blockchain to say, well, you know, how can we use this infrastructure for provenance, for example, to the supply chain to, to think about yeah. how supply chains are, are kind of audited. Um, and actually, Ruth Catler would say that it's really extremely important to kind of enter these very emerging technology spaces and to play there, to do serious play in those spaces and to say, actually, we're going to come in at the very beginning of this technology and do some serious play in order to influence how they're developed. So I think for us, we saw some stellar projects kind of using blockchain to kind of actually find ways to put kind of what we would call natural ecosystems onto the blockchain, not to monetize them, but actually to kind of keep them away from human influence. And I think for us, some of those creative works were really influential in how we were thinking about, okay, well, maybe the blockchain, for us, it's not about kind of intensifying agriculture because that's not what urban growers do. But maybe it's about thinking about decentralized relations a bit differently. The, the other thing is we were inspired uh, by some recent work which is looking at um, blockchain and the commons. So looking at how blockchain might be used to um, rethink governance systems for the commons through through the the affordances of particular um, aspects of the technology and there's some there's some prior work there which is which we built on which was looking at um, specifically Eleanor Ostrom's design principles for the commons and how particular facets of blockchain might let you operationalize those design principles and we tried to explore that you have kind of different developments of blockchain. So you, uh, now you have these platforms that allow you to build what's called decentralized autonomous organizations. So you can establish new types of organizations with their own governance structures, which are built on the blockchain. Um, you can enact um, things called smart contracts, which is a way of automating um, rules so so the design Ostrom's design principles talk a lot about how rule, rules are made and rules are changed and who can participate in um, rule making and voting mechanisms and membership of um, membership into communities so this combination of um, distributed autonomous organizations smart contracts and then you have something called tokenization which um, together allow you to um, create new kinds of um, incentivization mechanisms as well as um, decision making processes which are you know quite technical um, I don't know if I <laughs> might need some help here but um, those are the sorts of things that we explored in the last workshop. We worked with some blockchain developers um, to try and think about how we might create these new types of multi-species um, distributed autonomous organizations on the blockchain for the express purpose of creating an urban food commons. And so they then worked in groups to um, to create smart contracts and new decision-making processes through this technology um, as a way of governing their, their organizations. One of the things that, that draws me to, to the blockchain is its potential to, to trouble and unravel what we see to be a monolithic um, value system, a capitalist value system that's you know, predominantly human-centric that it's about the expansion of capital and wealth, obviously amongst the privileged few. And so the question is what, what platforms, what schemas, what technologies might enable us to, to think about different value systems that might coexist, that might um, uh, trouble one another. Um, I, I think by the same token, of course, um, the blockchain is deeply entangled in those capitalist modes of thinking. And so I think this has been a tension throughout the project is to ask ourselves, well, in what way does uh, the blockchain 
actually draw us into that, that mode of thinking as opposed to give us a different way to think about multiple value systems. Um, I think that's something we've kept alive in our discussions, but thinking about the more than human is to ask, well, um, what matters for others? What matters for those who may not ordinarily have some sort of voice um, to give to these discussions around value? And that was one of the key things throughout the project we've been involved in and in our ongoing work um, was to think, um, how do we um, enable a voice, if you like, recognizing, of course, not all things have voices like humans do, um, to, to construct new forms of value. I think it's clear that more than human governance in our current age is deeply wrong. If we think about industrial agricultural processes that just are extremely deleterious to soil microbes that, you know, just take out certain categories of pests. And I think for me, what's really interesting is when we think about food justice in a more than human sense, you know, on the one hand, we really need the soil microbes to be healthy because there's always a scary statistic what, that we're six or 10 global harvests away from the depletion of the soil. So we must take that really seriously. But then, you know, when we get to the point of like, well, who eats crops? Is it humans or slugs? You know, we also get into these fascinating sort of set of questions, like how are we governing food production and for who? So, you know, if, is it beneficial to humans to kind of preserve the soil microbes, but to kill the slugs? And I actually think it's a really serious question in the Anthropocene age to actually go one step above and say, well, we, we want to decenter the human. Actually, you know, human centricity has created capitalism that has is poisoned the earth and is responsible for massive inequality. And yet, on the other hand, what does that mean? For me, that's a very open and unsettled question. Um, and I think for me personally, kind of the, the methods that we used in the workshops were a way to just even open up that territory. We can say that, and, and in the workshops, it was very easy. People could pinpoint what injustice was. So, you know, sending any species to extinction was a total no-no, but it was much harder to settle what justice was. And so I think for me, you know, this lens, it definitely excludes some of the worst practices. But on the other hand, it does invite us to say, well, if we're really kind of going to take seriously this idea that it shouldn't be all about humans, you know, what does that mean? So I I'm really interested in spending more time in that space and taking it really seriously. Yeah, and I think I think we were interested in like m moving sort of away from an idea of food as a commodity to be traded, and then if you then think about food as a commons to be shared amongst a community, then it's if you work with urban growers, it's very difficult to, you know, they they understand very clearly what it means to um, to to have to involve other species in that commons because they know you know it's just part of their knowledge um, and so it was really thinking about who's kind of who's marginalized from the food system in the kind of the, the usual way of thinking about the food system and, and then the labor the unrecognized labor of the other species in the food system as well and so like when you talk to community growers it's like oh well the microbes are doing that work and the worms are doing that work and the birds are doing that work and the pollinators are doing that work and if you don't have the right pollinators, then you have to have the human labor to replace that, you know, those species that are doing that work. So it's like, but all of that, all of that work is not um, valued in the traditional, in the, in the dominant food system. So it's like, how might we use, how might we then kind of um, create an accounting system for that unrecognized and undervalued labor of all the species that are involved? And so, and then blockchain, you know, look like some possible mechanism to, to have that accounting system. That's kind of what the potential of it was for. So these are sort of warm weather crops. And um, 
What's actually what's really interesting about the koji plant is that the the flower has to get pollinated by hand. So Lutfen goes around with a paintbrush and she um, when the male flower opens, she takes pollen from the male flower and then she pollinates the female flower and that's the only way that you get the fruit. Um, so it's that really kind of interesting special knowledge and that labour and so that, that pollination would happen naturally in, in Bangladesh by a moth in the night and at a very specific time when one flowers and she, she physically closes the flower of the female until it is ready to be pollinated. So it's this really highly specialized technical oh, knowledge on, you know, this kind of multi-species understanding in, in the food web that's um, really interesting in this, in this particular place. We used a lot of speculation and fiction and, and gameplay. So, you know, we were not entirely rooted in reality. Um, but it allowed sort of the opening up of some thought experiments. And so one of the, so in the last workshop, they came up with three prototypes for new types of organizations on the blockchain. And so um, one of the prototypes um, that was developed in the third workshop was called, was it called Down to Earth? Yeah. It was called the Down to Earth D app Down. Is that? D apostrophe A O N um, down to earth, and it, it worked as a market exchange where um, different communities had a currency, and the value of each community's currency would be determined by the health of its soil as measured over time. And so there, that was the so the blockchain provided an in, incentivization mechanism to to support the health of the soil and, um, and, and every community on the network in the city would be incentivized to repair and nourish the soil of that community. So it's not specifically about the microbes in the soil that have a stake, but it's kind of mediated through, um, through the whole project and the three workshops. That was kind of what came out as what would be of, of most benefit when soil and microbes in the soil had a voice in the decision-making processes. The inference of your question is, could we build, for an example, a sensor that a worm would wear or something? And I think what we did was to try and stand back from that and say, what, what matters within this particular uh, ecological system? And so one of the projects that I think we might come to um, was around uh, a biodiversity and a flourishing. So um, one of the outcomes would be a greater biodiversity or an intensification of biodiversity and a greater flourishing because of that. And I think that becomes a much more interesting thing to think. Well, how do you start to gauge those things? How do you start to introduce a value scheme that perpetuates diversity instead of a kind of monolithic culture, so to speak? But I think it's fair to say that sensing technologies and algorithmic um, farming technologies are just really starting to burst onto the scene. Like we're just at the beginning of this agricultural revolution. So I think we're again at the kind of start of a, of a, a real sea change in how land is managed and I think our idea is really to take the idea of sensing the soil for example seriously but how could we use these emerging technologies for other means so I don't really think it's that far-fetched at all that that if we think about the monitoring leap that we've had in air quality even over the last decade or 15 years so I think in the coming future um, instrumented farms will be even more of a reality that, that as they are now and so we're also starting to think now about what does it mean to instrument in a more critical way, what does it mean to use instrumentation for more than human flourishing instead of intensification. So again sort of inhabiting these algorithmic food imaginaries before that technology has also gone mainstream.
So the farm started in the 1970s and it was just started by local people who wanted to grow their own food. It was squatted and now it's a charity um, and it basically exists to, um, to serve local people, to um, provide education about uh, food and the environment. It's, it's free and open to the public, anyone can come in and they provide volunteer opportunities for people with various ailments and health issues, uh, school groups. They have animals in the farmyard, so they're, they're a non-slaughter farm and they teach people about animal husbandry. They have a lot of rescue animals. Um, and they, yeah, they give people lots of opportunities to come and it's like really idyllic in the middle of highly intensified land development. The pressures on land are really high around here, so, you know, it's just quite important to cling on to it.